And the food delivery app said, we want to collect your location data to be able to verify your identity and protect your account. And then we saw 95% of the users saying yes. Hello, welcome to PayPod, where we bring you conversations with the trailblazer shaping the future of payments in fintech. My name is Gavin Rosenquist. Thanks for listening. With location intelligence, a company can analyze device behavior and location patterns to create a unique identity profile for users, thus distinguishing legitimate users from fraudsters without requiring additional inputs from the user. Pretty cool, huh? But how does it work? Today I'm chatting with Andre Fahaz, CEO and co-founder of Incognia, a mobile identity solution for apps that increases conversions and reduces fraud by enabling real-time recognition of trusted users. He sheds light on the idea of location intelligence, the shortcomings of two-factor authentication, and mentoring young entrepreneurs. Joining me now, Andre Fahaz. So we all want and expect a high level of security and fraud prote protection on our phones, our computers, any device. But we also hate when it's a hassle. We love to complain about when that stuff gets in our way from our whatever it is we're trying to do at that particular moment. How do you, how do you manage that delicate balance between implementing stringent security measures to prevent fraud and maintaining a smooth user-friendly experience? Yeah, well, this is interesting because I'd say one of the key questions here is which of the two do we want more, right? Yeah. And and one one thing I saw, I think it was two years ago or so, was I was analyzing some of the opt-in rates for the use of 2FA on some of the, the major uh, like internet platforms. And what I found was was quite interesting. Like the first one was, was Twitter, uh, now X. I saw that the number of users that used uh, some form of MFA on their platform was less than 2%, which was quite surprising. Wow, that is surprising. Right? So if, if someone takes over your account on that platform, uh, they, they can basically like start scanning people and, and posting whatever they want. So it's it's not the type of account that you want to lose. The, the second was uh, Gmail accounts. And we saw that less than 10% of the users have enabled MFA. I think it was like 2020 or something like that. So, so the conclusion I, I got to uh, when I saw this was that like people are more worried about user experience than security. But there are many applications that they need to provide more security because it's core to their business, right? So if you're a bank, if you're an e-commerce company, and you don't don't offer security to your users. In the end of the day, you're going to pay for that, right? Like users are going to call you, they're going to sue you, and you'll end up having give their money back. So, so I'd say these type of companies are the ones that are most challenged because nothing's going to happen if if you lose your Twitter account, right? Twitter is not going to pay you anything because of that. It's just going to be Elon's not going to throw some money at us. Come on. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. But but the bank will, right? So these are the companies I, I'd say are the most challenged with with this issue, which is how do you balance user experience and security? And, and there are multiple ways to address this. There there's new technology that enable uh, these companies to to do this. But to be honest, most of them has have been moving very slowly. Another example. Uh, now from the from the financial services industry is that I'm originally from Brazil and I moved to the US about four years ago and and I had a very interesting experience because everyone coming to this country they, they come with the impression that like everything is extremely advanced and the technology is on another level but when I tried to open my first few bank accounts I was impressed because most of the banks were still relying on SMS. So they were texting me like a six digit code mm -hmm. to, to verify my identity. And it's been probably 10 years that I've seen this in, in Brazil. Like most of the financial institutions were already using other forms of, of authentication that were more secure, more user-friendly. Uh, so when I saw that, I was like, okay, let's, 
let's do the following. Let's let's do a research and try to identify what is the the penetration of SMS based authentication in the financial services industry in Brazil and in the US and that's as compared to two. And it was quite impressive. We did this survey in 2021. And what we found was that uh, less than 2% of the top 100 financial institutions in Brazil, they were used SMS for authentication purposes. And here, over 75% were still relying on SMS. And there are multiple problems with SMS. The first one is you can intercept SMS at scale. You can literally like buy a, a it's legal. It, it's it's not a legal thing, but you can buy an antenna that basically scans all the SMS traffic in, in the surroundings, and you can literally read everything that's being texted from one one device to the other. Some of these might be the six digit codes that you use to access your your bank account, so you can do that. Well, that's kind of fun. I don't want people reading my texts, Andre. Like what? Yeah. That- would have that is possible. Gee, that is possible. I like that. <laughs> so yeah, that is possible. The other thing is uh, you, you can scam the telco operator to migrate the line to your um, SIM card. So you can literally like take over someone else's um, phone number. And if you do that, you're able to take over this person's um, bank account. So yeah, I was, I was quite scared to see that still... 75% of the top financial institutions in the U.S. relied on that. So clearly, uh, they're not moving as quickly as they should uh, to not only upgrade their defenses, but also to improve their user experience. Because for me, honestly, this is the worst possible method of, of authentication because they need to go there, get the code, type it again, etc. It's not a great experience. I mean, from a security standpoint, it's terrible. So yeah. I mean, I, I did that. I had that sound. Jay, I, from a major financial institution, I'm not going to name names, but a major financial institution. And I had to log in and I was on a different, uh, I think I, I think I was just on a different like Google profile. It sent me a code to my, to my text. And I mean, it's today. So like you're, so you're saying that, that they were far behind when you got here four years ago and it, it's not getting much better. Nope. It's not. Uh, but there's one thing that I believe was was the primary reason for the financial institutions in Brazil to to move forward more quickly, which was real time payments. So currently in the Brazilian market, real time payments represents the vast majority of, of payments. Um, it's already bigger than uh, cash and credit cards combined, and basically uh, this this means that you can transfer money from one bank account to another instantly with no limits. Mm -hmm. And one hand, this is great because it's like it it accelerates cars, it it boosts the economy, et cetera. On the other hand, from a security standpoint, it's quite scary, right? Because you can move money right away. There's not not gonna be anyone to reveal that that transaction. Yeah, there's no like intermediary making sure it's legit. Yeah. Yeah. And and there's no, no way to revoke that transaction. You can't say like, oh, that was a mistake. I want my I want my money back. So from a fraud standpoint, that is quite scary. But the thing is, sometimes you only solve problems when they become very latent, right? And and this is what happened. Uh, this was launched in 2020. The banks were like, they they were really impacted by. Uh, fraud, and they had to move very quickly to upgrade their defenses. Right, so the the financial institution there, they they had to move away from, for example, SMS, and they started adopting more secure technologies. Um, and and currently, uh, the fraud rates are actually very low because they all had evolved in in, in that direction. So I believe the same is going to happen here in the US once we're time payments. Uh, um, become more prevalent, and and there are a few initiatives that are going on, like FedNow and, and RTP, et cetera, that might send the the financial services industry in, in that direction. Let me uh, let, let's talk about location intelligence. It's another aspect of what you guys do. You can analyze device behavior and location patterns and create a unique identity profile for users, thus distinguishing legitimate users from 
fraudsters without requiring additional inputs from the user. Did I explain that well? Yeah, perfectly. Perfectly. Could you elaborate on how device and location signals help in creating a u unique user identity? Yeah, yeah. So I'd say the key insight behind this idea is, is that for every online interaction or transaction, we have to do this from a physical device and from a physical location. Right? So we, we thought that if we understood these two things really well, we would be able to uh, very precisely determine what is risky and what is not. So for example, um, let's say someone is trying to open a bank account, right? So they downloaded a mobile app and they're, they're trying to open an account. First, if we've seen this device trying to open other accounts in the past, that's not normal behavior, right? Like why, why are you trying to open three, four or five accounts on the same institution? using different identities and using the same device, right? So uh, that, that'd be the first uh, thing we, we would check for. The second is as part of the process, you have to share some information about you, right? So one of these data points would be, for example, like, oh, we, we need to scan your driver's license. And one of the data points that we have on the driver's license is the physical address of that individual, right? So what we can do there is we can look at the location signals that we're collecting from that device to determine the likelihood of that device living in that physical address, right? So for example, we see that 85% of bank accounts that are open on mobile apps are open when the user is currently at home, which means that the real time location of that device is going to match that physical address perfectly, right? So the likelihood of that being a legitimate account is much higher if we see that. So this is the kind of thing that we look for when we're trying to determine risk, but we are also able to use the same data to identify the bad behavior, right? So for example, one of the things we see a lot is a very high concentration of devices in the same place. What is that? Well, that's probably like organized crime, right? Like fraud ring that has access to multiple devices. And these people are finding vulnerabilities in the systems of like different financial institutions or e-commerce merchants and, and things like that. And once they identify these vulnerabilities, they start exploiting them. So for example, if there is a vulnerability related to creating accounts on the food delivery platform, for example. And for every new account, you get a 20% coupon to make your first purchase. Well, I can eat for free if, if I find that, right? So I, I can start creating one account after the other and in placing orders that are below $20 and I can eat for free for the rest of my life, right? So people do that. And, and this is the type of behavior that we identify. Well, we've seen multiple accounts being created from the same physical location before. So we're not going to, going to allow any new account to, to be created from this place. Same applies to devices, right? If we see the same device trying to do the same thing over and over, that's not the type of behavior we expect from a good user. So given the apprehension and, and sometimes even fear that people have regarding being tracked, is location intelligence something that people are nervous about in your experience? It depends. If they don't know, why this data is being collected, they're, they're certainly going to be apprehensive and they're not going to want to share, right? So we, one interesting experiment we, we've run was the, with the same app, we had a group of users that would receive that like classic pop-up asking for the user to share location. And the pop-up would, would not say anything. It was just like the app wants to collect your location. For that first group, we saw that less than 20% of the users were willing to share that information. Then the second group, we've sent the same pop-up, but we've explained why we wanted to collect that data. In this case, it was, a, it, by the way, a food delivery app. And the food delivery app said, we want to collect your location data to be able to verify your identity and protect your account. And then we saw 95% of the users say yes. Exactly, exactly. So when you're transparent with your user and they understand how 
uh, the app is going to use this data, they're way more willing to to share the information. So I think that's that's the most important thing. Is like if you're using it for a good purpose, tell your user. Right. Obviously, there are some apps that are collecting location for other purposes. Sure. They're not necessarily going to make people comfortable. So these apps are not going to share. Um, but if the use case is like security and fraud prevention, like most people are more worried about having their bank accounts and their credit card information stolen than having their location information being available to, to the apps. If someone travels a lot, is, does that confuse things? Does that make it difficult for, you know, the location to be consistent enough to not kind of screw them up if they were trying to access their, their information or their accounts? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and I'm actually a, a great example of a user that travels a lot. So if, if it's working for me, I'm, I'm confident that's, that's working for, for other people. But basically, the, the way it works is given we're looking at two things at the same time, it, it tends not to be a problem, right? So we're looking at the device and the location. So if you're traveling, it means that the location is changing, but the device is still the same, right? The dev device is coming with you. you. Very rarely you will forget your phone before taking like a, a, a plane yeah, somewhere, right? So uh, the only scenario- That would be crippling, wouldn't it? That would be like, the, oh, yeah, right? I, would, I, would, I couldn't even function anymore in this day and age with it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, you, you, you would probably not, not even be able to, to board the plane. Because that is, yeah, you, you're right. You would have <laughs> the QR code, right? But True. assuming that this happens, right? You forgot your fault, you got on a plane, you arrived somewhere else, uh, and, and only then you realize, oh, I, f I forgot my phone. This would be a scenario in which we would be confused, right? Because we would see- a whole new device in a completely different location trying to log into your account, we would say, well, this is probably somewhere else, someone else. But in these cases, the user can still like use other ways to authenticate themselves uh, to, to that application. Worst case, you would need to call the contact center and say like, hey, I forgot my phone. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was in the West Coast, now I'm on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, swear it's me, really I swear it's me. <laughs> exactly. Is uh, the the two FA is that is that good? Like, is that something? To, for example, you know, like a lot, if I'm logging into something like my Google account from somewhere, I get the little thing on my phone. All I got to do is hit yes, it's me, and I'm able to get in, no problem. Same thing with you know sometimes with streaming apps and whatnot. Is that is that a a good way of doing it? A, a good way of authenticating? Yeah, it it depends on the the method, right? So. For example, SMS is something to avoid as right. much as possible. If you have the ability to use something else, this other thing would always be better than SMS. Um, like the authenticator apps so, and stuff like that? Exactly. Authenticator apps are much better from a security standpoint. Email, like e even if instead of sending like the six digit code to your phone number, like if they send, send it to your email, it's already much better from a security standpoint. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it really depends on the method. Like the most secure is usually the one with that also creates most friction. So for example, harder tokens, like that's probably the most secure thing you could use, but then you need to be like carrying these like USB sticks around with you all the time. Right. So, so it's not the most user-friendly, but yeah, yes, I, wouldn't, say, I didn't even know what that was. So a harder token would be actually like a physical drive or device that you carry that is your, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's, yeah, yeah. that's probably not in the cards for a lot of people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that's, that's probably the most secure, but that's a lot of friction. I, I'd say, yeah, authenticator apps are probably the, the best choice for the, the regular user because, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's more secure than SMS. The user experience is very similar to any, any form of two, uh, like 2FA. But ideally, but this is not uh, dependent on the user. Ideally, the app uses some form of what we call zero factor authentication, which is basically authenticating you behind the scenes, right? So collecting some data signals from your device so that they can determine if, like, what was the likelihood of that being used. So, for example, location is one of those, device recognition is another, right? So, like, we, we don't change our phones very often, right? I, I think the average uh, here in the U.S. is every uh, two and a half years, for example, right? 
which means that we're going to be holding the same device for some time. So that is a great signal, right? If you're always logging into your bank account, for example, from the same device, we don't need to ask for that uh, six digit code all the time because it's still the same device, right? And even if it's a new device, one interesting thing we see with location is that about 95% of new devices are set up when you're at home, which means that even if we don't know that device yet, um, but we know the behavior of your old device, we're able to see, well, even though this is a new device, this user is at the place, the, the safest place for that person, right? Which would be their home. So we can verify that new device right away without the need for 2FA or any any kind of friction. Okay. If somebody is, you're doing a location tracking or, or whatever you call it, is there, is it all automated? Is there ever a time when a human gets involved or is it all happening behind the scenes? There's only one moment in which the human gets involved, which is in this case, the user, which is to allow the user of a location or not, right? So the first time we ask you like, do you allow us to use location authenticate you or to secure your account, et cetera. Once the user says yes, there's nothing else uh, required from, from that individual. So from, from that moment onwards, we're going to like be collecting this data behind the scenes and verify like, okay, this, this is doing you, et cetera. So I'd say the most important thing here, particularly when it comes to privacy, is that ideally all the platforms should do what we decided to do, which was we don't collect any personal information. So we don't have their names, their phone numbers, their email addresses, like social security numbers, anything like that. Uh, the, the party who holds the personal information about that individual is our customer, in this case, the bank or the merchants, but we don't have that data, right? So what we do is our customer creates a unique identifier for that user. So they're probably going to encrypt your, your like email address, for example, or your phone number. Mm -hmm. They will send that encrypted information back to us. And this is how we understand that we're talking about the same person. But we don't know if this is John or Andre. We don't know if it's a man or a woman. All we know is that this is the device linked to this unique identifier that is randomized. And in doing that, we're protecting both our customer and our user in important way because the reality when it comes to security is that the only data that is really secure is the data that you don't have. <laughs> because it's a matter of time for every platform to be breached and eventually for this data to be exposed, right? So if we don't have the names of our users, for example, and eventually a, a data breach occurs, it will be very hard for people to tie these location signals back to a person, right? Same applies to our customer. If something happens on their side and there is a data breach on their side, like, okay, the, the personal information of their users is going to leak, but they didn't receive any location data because we are storing that part, right? So we're basically creating this wall be between like the location data and the personal data. Well, that's good. I mean, that should help people, people's, uh, you know, hesitancy to accept something like this, as long as they know it, like you talked about before, it's just being transparent and it's about educating and all that. And I think that, you know, I mean, it's understandable. We get, we get asked all the time if we want to share our data. The funny thing is, and we've talked about on this podcast before with other guests is it's like, I mean, how quickly do people just hit agree, 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 agree when they've got something on their phone or their computer, they just want to get to whatever they're looking for. And it's like, like we pick and choose what we're going to be, what we're going to be freaked out by. Like someone might hear what you do and be like, oh, I don't want anybody tracking me, but yet they're doing some shady card game that they got, <laughs> they got and they're, you know, they're like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll buy some more, some more tokens so that I can, I can play, you know, spades or whatever. So it's funny that sort of a catch 22 with people that they, their comfortability level just, just varies by person. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember a story of a, I think it was a flashlight app that later on was, was uh, revealed that the, the app was, was, was basically selling data from their users and they were asking for every type of information that was completely unrelated to flashlight. <laughs> 
<laughs> See, they were asking for location. <laughs> See, they were the dark. asking for it. <laughs> Yeah, access to your microphone. Like, why do you need access to my microphone to right, right. <laughs> improve the flashlight experience? Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, later on they they were caught. They were selling like data, hundreds of millions of users because yeah. it was a free app. A lot of people downloaded it, and it was launched even before the operating systems offered their own flashlight apps. Right. So a lot of people have downloaded this. Yeah, what a great tool. So, yeah, a, a lot of weird thing can can, can happen in, in apps that. Seem like they're not would not be a, a threat. Mm-hmm. So this is the third company you founded, correct? Yeah, we, we could consider the third is still kind of the same company, but it, it it went through different iterations. Are you a tech guy or are you a business guy who has good tech people around him? It's interesting. I started as a tech guy, so yeah, my my background is is in computer science. Started very very early. But, but yeah, eventually I, I realized that I was, I was better at translating like business problems to the tech people. So today I consider myself more of a, more of a product guy. Actually, I kind of sit in between tech and, and business trying to facilitate the conversation because yeah, uh, sometimes the engineers have a hard time understanding the, the business people and, and vice versa. Yeah, that's for sure. I saw you're a mentor with Endeavor as well, a nonprofit that helps high impact entrepreneurs dream bigger and scale faster. How, how did you get involved with them? Yeah, actually, initially I, I got involved as uh, one of the entrepreneurs receiving help and, oh. and mentorship from from other others that, that were more experienced. Uh, really, really great institution. Like they they've been very helpful in like during the the toughest times in our journey and yeah now now it's great to be able to to give back and 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 help other entrepreneurs so so yeah that's that's essentially how it works like most of the people who are like helping the the newer entrepreneurs like they they started just just like me and after gaining some experience they started helping the other so it's it's been a great experience it's obviously very hard to be an entrepreneur you know that well um when it comes to mentorship you know you can give advice you can nurture but you can't give someone some of those innate characteristics that an entrepreneur needs. Have you ever had a situation where you're like, oh man, this person is not cut out for this life? Yeah. Well, there were a few situations like this. It's obviously like very difficult to like in a a one hour conversation, um, get to that conclusion and say like, you you should be doing something else. (laughs) So that's my, that's my mentorship. Go do something else. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But, but yeah, I, 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 usually my approach is to, to like ask questions, uh, rather than like try to, to give them answers. So when they're, when they're struggling and, and trying to, for example, recently I, I got a lot of entrepreneurs like reaching out and, and asking about fundraising, right? Because fundraising was very easy in 2021 and then suddenly it became very hard, right? So people were asking about it, et cetera. And, 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 and my questions were always trying to make them think if they really needed to fundraise at the moment, right? Because uh, when, when you're an, an entrepreneur, particularly, you know, like tech startups, et cetera, it, fundraising sometimes can become like the the goal. It's like not really building a business, but fundraising, building a business that can fundraise it. And, and that's not really it. Uh, fundraising is, is, is a tool. So in many of these cases, for example, uh, the entrepreneurs decided that they were going to keep focused on building their business. They would be more conscious about like spending money. They would be a bit more conservative until the market got a little bit better. Um, and now they're finally going out and starting to fundraise and being more successful because they, they were really focused on building the business. So yeah, that's, that's the type of mentorship that, that I usually uh, provide to other entrepreneurs is like helping them question what they're trying to do next because uh, usually a lot of people like to follow frameworks and, and playbooks and things they looking around and seeing everybody there's a lot of business books and entrepreneurship books out there yeah but the reality is that every business is completely different and there's no framework that works for everybody uh, there's only one thing in my opinion that's common to the successful 
entrepreneurs, which is uh, the ability to get back on your feet when something bad happens, right? Uh, at the end of the day, the ones that are like resilient, keep pushing it, even when it's hard, those are the ones that succeed. There's no other characteristic in my opinion that uh, defines a good entrepreneur. Like some are creative, some are not, some are like super hard workers and there are some entrepreneurs that don't work really hard but they're still successful uh but they insist in the same idea and, and they keep moving forward there are entrepreneurs that are great recruiters there are others that are not um but yeah in, in the end of the day if you're very resilient and you're able to deal with adversity your chances are are much better so uh, that's a great point well, Andre, with uh, Incognia, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate your time and teaching us all about uh, all about location intelligence and everything else. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. It was a pleasure.